Ambassador Dahinden, Monsieur Longchamp, friends, colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here for two reasons. Firstly, because I've been a great admirer of SDC and what it has done around the world, including with my institute, which is headquartered in New Delhi, India. And secondly, because you've chosen a theme which clearly adds substance to the work that the IPCC has been doing in assessing the science of climate change and bringing it to the attention of the global community. But I must say I'm also a little diffident and feel a little out of place because I'm told this beautiful location is used largely for rock concerts. And I'm afraid I'm the furthest away from performing any kind of musical act. However, what I will bring to your attention is the reason why I think global society has to be concerned about climate change and why we need a global initiative to deal with this problem because it strikes at the very root of development, particularly when it comes to the poorest of the poor in different parts of the world. As you may be aware, we have brought out three reports. These are the three working group reports of the IPCC, which form part of the fifth assessment report. And we are now working on the synthesis report, which will come out in early November. Now, let me say at the very outset that the whole concept of sustainable development and the opportunities we have to move on a path of sustainable development are intimately linked with various aspects of climate change. And just to refresh your memory, the most widely used definition of sustainable development is that which had been popularized by the Brundtland Commission, which says that it's that form of development which meets the needs of the present generation without compromising on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now you can imagine if we as human society are bringing about a change in the Earth's climate, then clearly we are also affecting the opportunity for future generations to be able to meet their own needs. But climate change is not really something that to do with the future because climate change is taking place today. It has been taking place for several decades. And let me bring to your attention one very important finding that we came out with in the Working Group 1 report of the IPCC, which was released in September, and uh, which was led by my very fine colleague, Dr. Thomas Stocker, who, as you know, is from Switzerland. And this report clearly said that there's a 95% certainty that the changes that have taken place since the middle of the last century are extremely likely to have been the result of increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases, which human activity has actually brought about. Now, when we use the term extremely likely, we are assigning a probability of 95%. Now, when we know that human society is affecting and changing the climate of this planet to a level of confidence of 95%, clearly that requires us to take action to deal with this challenge. Because these changes that we are bringing about are unprecedented over decades to millennia. In other words, in a short period, a relatively short period of time, we have brought about changes in the climate which have not happened for millennia, for thousands of years. This is the extent to which we are bringing about changes that obviously have a major implication for the opportunity for human society to develop in a sustainable manner. How is this manifesting itself? Well, we now have enough observations 
to show that the atmosphere is warming, the oceans are warming, sea level rise is taking place, there are climate extremes which are occurring, there are reductions in snow and ice, and in fact, in the, at the end of May, I was in the Arctic region, in a place called Ni Olesen, which is the northern tip of Norway, that is supposed to be the northernmost habitation that exists round the year in, uh, with, uh, at, a, at a, a latitude of 79 degrees north. And you can see over there the kinds of changes that we are bringing about. The Arctic, may I mention, is warming at about twice the rate of the rest of the planet. And therefore, the extent of sea ice that you had in the Arctic has re reduced appreciably. Let me focus on the drivers of climate change, at least to the extent human society is influencing it. We know that there are several sectors of the economy which are responsible for emissions of greenhouse gases. There is, of course, transport, there is energy production, there is industry, there are residential and commercial buildings, but there is also what is known as AFOLU, agriculture, forestry, and land use. And this accounts for 24% of the total emissions that are taking place currently. And this is one of the areas where perhaps it is easiest for, for us to bring about change because we can certainly stop deforestation and mount efforts by which we can increase afforestation. This world has enough land by which we can increase green cover and forest cover. However, I'll get into the issue of mitigation, that means reduction of greenhouse gases a little later. Let me tell you about the fact that in the year 2010, the world emitted 49 gigatons of CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gases. And 10 years earlier, this total quantity was 39 gigatons. That means in a short period of 10 years, we have added 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalent of emissions, roughly an average of one gigaton per year. Now, if you look at this in the context of the fact that it was in 1992 that the world agreed on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, then clearly the trend that you find is totally in opposition to what was determined as action that has to be taken globally under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this only highlights the fact that we need to do something to deal with this problem. Why should we worry about the impacts of climate change? Well, because they're very diverse, they're widespread, and they're spread over the entire globe. Just to give you some specific details, there's an increase in extreme events. There's an increase in extreme precipitation events. There's an increase in heat waves. So much so that those heat waves which took place and have been taking place once in 20 years, will by the end of this century, if we do nothing about this problem, occur once in two years. And you would all know the terrible heat wave that took place in the year 2003 in Europe, centered around Paris and several other regions. And that led to a number of deaths. Now, if an occurrence like that, and I'm not saying that that occurrence was the result of climate change, but uh, what I am saying, without any hesitation, is the fact that a current such as those will take place in the future with greater intensity and greater frequency. And you can imagine if such an occurrence which takes place, let's say, in once in 20 years, were to take place in once, once in two years, then clearly we have to be prepared for this problem. This means we have to adapt to the impacts of climate change. There are other impacts that we need to be concerned about, which of course have very serious implications for the poorest regions of the world. These are, for instance, the impacts on agriculture. We now have sufficient evidence to show 
that already the impacts of agriculture are being felt in crops like wheat, maize, rice, and others. And if we don't do anything about dealing with the, the problem of climate change and start mitigating emissions of greenhouse gases, then by the end of this century, clearly we would have a sharp reduction in yields. And that means some of those regions where people, and these are poor farmers, who are dependent on rain-fed agriculture and have very low, low levels of yields, would obviously not be able to grow enough food for themselves. Because there's a large part of the globe in the developing countries where people are not really growing to sell their produce in the market. They grow just about enough to take care of their own basic needs for themselves and their families. And if that's not going to be possible, then clearly you can understand that these regions where you already have very high malnutrition and hunger will be facing a severe problem in the future. So we need to be concerned about some of these issues. We need to be worried about the fact that there is a de redistribution taking place in marine fisheries. Why is that happening? Well, because the oceans are warming. We have found that between the period 1970 and 2071 and 2010, uh, about 90 percent of the energy that has been generated as a result of, as a result of global warming and climate change has gone into the oceans. And they have now warmed to a depth of 700 meters. Now clearly with that kind of change, fish stocks that were used to living in one part of the oceans will move to another region where they're better acclimatized to deal with the temperatures that exist over there. So these marine fisheries are being redistributed. And several persons whose livelihoods are dependent on fishing are being affected as a result. There's also greater disease as a result of these extreme events which I mentioned to you, extreme precipitation events, where you have a large amount of heavy rainfall taking place in a short period of time. Now that not only is a risk, but it also affects the ability of communities to get enough water because you can't impound it, you can't store it, it just runs off. And this is happening even in those parts of the world. There is evidence that in some parts of the world where you have a, an actual decline in average rainfall, a large part of the rainfall is going to occur and is occurring uh, as heavy fall. So, Disease will increase also because of malnourishment. It will increase because water is going to become more scarce and therefore some of the pollution that you see in the water will also become far more serious. And what is also something to be kept in mind is the increase in vector-borne diseases because a number of pests that carry disease will now be able to thrive and possibly multiply in conditions that are going to be very different climatically than what we have seen in the past. The result of all this on a social basis would be displacement of people, risks of violent conflict, because climate change would amplify the drivers like poverty and economic shocks. And all of this clearly is not a scenario that we would want to see in the world. Overall, climate change is likely to slow down economic growth. And it could prolong and create new poverty traps. So what is it that we can do? Well, the good news is that if human society is determined and works together and uses all its capacity, uses all the knowledge and technology that we have, and uses the ability to use, to develop institutions and strengthen institutions, that can take care of the problem, we can solve this problem. We can ensure that we bring climate change within limits by actions that would involve adaptation as well as mitigation. 
because adaptation would be essential simply since the past emissions and therefore increase in concentration of greenhouse gases will lead to impacts in the future even if we were to bring down our emissions down to zero at this point of time. So we have no choice but to adapt to the impacts of climate change. But adaptation alone will not solve the problem because we are likely to cross certain tipping points and thresholds beyond which adaptation would become very challenging. And therefore at the same time we need a global effort by which we reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and mitigate them by employing methods that bring about a reduction in the use of fossil fuels, bring about an expansion of forest cover that can also use renewable energy on a large scale, perhaps nuclear, and carbon capture and storage. And we would also have to come up with technologies that would allow us to use bioenergy on a substantial scale. So these are all options, and I'm, I'm not recommending one or the other. But I think human society and countries and communities will have to decide what suits them best. But clearly, what we have found in the fifth assessment report is that by 2050, we will have to treble or quadruple low and zero carbon uh, forms of energy supply based on renewable energy. So this is a direction in which the world will have to move very rapidly. And we also know that by the end of this century, if we want to limit temperature increase to two degrees Celsius, which is the aspirational goal set by negotiators under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, then we will have to make sure that total emissions either become zero or go into the negative range. So that's the challenge before us. We need to adapt and we need to bring about a very rapid reduction in the emissions of greenhouse gases. And if we delay this, then clearly the cost of taking action, the longer the delay, will be much higher. So the time to act is now and we need to put in place policies we need to take in hand research and development, and we need to bring about public awareness by which we can eliminate the risks that lie in the current trend of climate change. Now, here, I would like to say we need to think out of the box, because I just want to give you an example. I would normally have shown you a very brief film. Uh, there are 1.3 billion people in the world who have no access to electricity. Now, we could either wait for centralized electricity supply to reach them through transmission and distribution and, of course, investments on their part to be able to connect to the grid. But on the other hand, there are opportunities by which we can use decentralized forms of renewable energy production. And that, may I say, my institute, Terry, which is located in, headquartered in New Delhi, but we have a presence all over the world, has launched a program called Lighting a Billion Lives. And here what we do is a multiplicity of initiatives, but one of them I'd like to bring to your attention. We train a woman in a village to charge solar lanterns, which we have designed, and they use LED lighting systems. And she rents them out at night to the entire village. She gets them back in the daytime. She's got a solar panel on the roof, so this is solar energy which is going into solar lanterns and these lanterns are providing light to people who otherwise would live in darkness or would be lighting in a very feeble manner with the use of kerosene lamps. And these kerosene lamps also lead to toxic emissions which go into the lungs, particularly of women and children who are sitting around these lights and therefore what we really need is to break away from past practice and also break away from conventional solutions which have been tried in other parts of the world. This is where may I submit that an organization like SDC has been very imaginative, has been very forward looking and they have not only been able to support development efforts but they've also been deeply involved in innovation, which is something that gives hope 
to a large number of people across the world. So let me end by saying that the impacts of climate change are certainly a major deterrent, uh, are a major threat to um, sustainable development. And to be able to ensure a reduction in emissions of greenhouse gases and to ensure that we adapt to the impacts of climate change, then sustainable development will have to be the path that we follow. Just to end by giving you an example, if there are going to be extreme events that will lead to risks for people and risk to property, then clearly we need to strengthen our disaster risk uh, management institutions and approaches. And if we were to do that, then clearly dealing with climate-related risks will also help us deal with other forms of risks that particularly the poorest in the world are most vulnerable to. So this is the challenge before us, and I think if we put our hands together, it is clearly not beyond the capacity of human society to be able to deal with this challenge. As you're aware, the Secretary General of the UN is holding a major meeting on the 23rd of September to focus on climate change. And from what I've been told, I had a telephone conversation with his, with his uh, staff just two evenings ago. We may get something close to 125 to 130 heads of state and head, heads of government. And I hope from that meeting, these leaders will go back with a resolve that we not only have to deal with this problem in our areas of power and strength, but also collectively across the globe. So let us hope for the best. And here I I'll just end with two quotations from Mahatma Gandhi, who was a person ahead of his time. And Gandhi said very rightly, a technological society has two choices. First, it can wait until catastrophic failures expose systemic deficiencies, distortion, and self-deceptions. Or secondly, a culture can provide social checks and balances to correct for systemic distortion prior to catastrophic failures. So I think we don't have to suffer failures and ca catastrophe to be able to experience the seriousness of these happenings. We have enough knowledge today to know that we need to take certain steps to be able to avoid them. It's also absolutely essential that we define progress in somewhat different terms. The whole world focuses on economic progress by measuring the growth in GDP. But if that pattern of growth is leading to impacts on all our ecosystems, all the environment around us, and particularly causing climate change, then clearly we have to find a better measure for defining what human progress is. And on this, Mahatma Gandhi rightly said, speed is irrelevant if you're going in the wrong direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patel. I will give you the microphone. I, I would just like to ask you a, a question after your speech. You have worked for so many years on climate change and its effects. You have, have you seen any positive changes? Because when we listen to you, we think, oh my goodness, the situation is only getting worse. But can you give us maybe a little positive message to say that you know, since you've been working for so long, things must have changed a little bit? I hope by referring to the fact that I've worked so many years, I hope you're not saying that I've worked no, much too long. I <laughs> never would have said something like that. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, there's so many examples of success that inspire you. I give you the example of what we're doing in villages. We've covered about 3,000 villages in India and Africa. If you look at uh, countries, several of them have very proactive renewable energy policies in place. Some countries have introduced carbon taxes. Uh, and what is most heartening is to go down to the community level. There are communities that are innovating and trying to use energy in an efficient way uh, to employ renewable energy options to the extent possible, and most importantly, trying to adapt to the impacts of climate change. 
So I think there's a, a whole wealth of um, examples and experiences that give you a lot of confidence and inspiration. What we need to do is to scale these up. And in my view, the only way to do that is to create awareness on the problem, the seriousness of the problem, but as you rightly indicated, also highlight some of the solutions that are being implemented and can be implemented. So I'm truly optimistic. I believe we will be able to get over this challenge, but we don't have the luxury of time. We'll have to move very quickly. Thank you very much, Dr. Pichari. Thank you very much. <laughs>